Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, may I please again reiterate the request to switch off your mobile phones or just turn them to silent. Uh, I'm greatly honored to be moderating today's session uh, titled Vistas Unveiled, Three Centuries of Travel Writing by Muslim Women. We have with us one of the editors of this anthology, Shovan Lambert Hurley, and two panelists, Muniza Shamsi and Vajiha Heather. Let me first introduce them to you so that you can see um, what uh, work, substantial work, they all have to their credit. Shoban Lambert Hurley is a professor of global history at the University of Sheffield, UK. She's a cultural historian of modern South Asia with particular interests in women, gender, and Islam. There is a strong interdisciplinary aspect to her re uh, research reflected in her analyses of how different literary yarns, including reformist writing, travelogues, and autobiography have evolved in South Asia in the modern period. From 2015 to 2018, she led a three-year collaborative project entitled Veil Warriors, uh, Veiled Voyagers, Muslim Women Travelers from Asia and the Middle East, funded by the Leverhulme Trust. And the project's main output is the book we are here to discuss today, Three Centuries of Travel Writing by Muslim Women. Welcome to Lahore, Shovan. Muniza Shamsi is a Pakistani writer, critic, literary journalist, bibliographer, and editor. She's the author of a literary history, Hybrid Tapestries, The Development of Pakistani English Literature, and is the bibliographic representative of the Journal of Commonwealth Literature, as well as the editor of three pioneering anthologies of Pakistani English literature. Shamsi's grandmother, and that, this is very interesting, Shamsi's grandmother in Lucknow Feminist and activist Begum Inam Fatma Habibullah was the author of a travelogue, Tasirate Safare Europe, about her journey to Britain in 1924 and is included in Shovan's book. So, therefore, her presence here will generate interesting trajectories of travel writing in South Asia. Thank you for your presence here today. Vajia Heather is a young writer and editor. Um, her essays and features are, you know, her major areas in her essays and features are culture, books, and the publishing industry, among others. Currently, she's the editor of the books and travel sections at the News on Sunday, a local English weekly. So um, I think her uh, comments will be valuable for us as we draw um, a thread through the various narratives uh, that we're going to discuss here. Thank you all for your presence. Uh, we'll be opening the house to questions at the end or near the end of the session. Um, I'd like to begin with asking Shovan about the picture on the title page. Could you talk to us a little about this? Because it was very interesting when she was telling me about it. <laughs> uh, thank you for that uh, question. And, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, with you all in Lahore to be sharing this, this work, um, which is very dear to my heart. And all the more because I have um, Moniza Shamsi next to me, whose own family are featured in this, in this volume. Um, so this uh, picture that you see on the front of the uh, the book, uh, I think, really captures what this book is about, which is some amazing and intrepid women who made the effort to travel right across the world. And this book really um, captures women who traveled right from the 17th century up to the mid-20th century. We, we stop with the, um, the spread of the jet engine um, that made transatlantic uh, travel more easily, um, more easy from 1958. Um, and this uh, picture that you see on the front of the book is actually uh, an image of uh, three travelers, uh, two female and one male. 
Um, and the one uh, on the far side of the picture here, on the left-hand side from your perspective, is uh, Princess Abada Sultan of Bhopal. Um, and uh, some of you may know that my earliest uh, work, uh, my PhD work, which became my first book, was on the state of Bhopal. And uh, thus, it was really a pleasure to be able to feature that on this book. Um, so uh, uh, next to her is her son, who will be familiar to many of you, I'm sure, as well, uh, Sherayar Mohammed Khan, who was Foreign Secretary of Pakistan, also Chairman of the Pakistan Cricket Board. Um, and at partition, uh, Sherayar Mia was uh, studying in London. So uh, uh, Abda Sultan went to meet her son there, and there she bought uh, this car, which you see on the front of the, <laughs> on the book, and she loaded uh, her son and their belongings, um, and also uh, her um, uh, companion um, with, with her in the car, and they drove from, uh, from London to Pakistan, and that is how she arrived in this country. Um, and this pic particular picture that you see here was actually taken on the Italian Riviera in the late 1940s, and I think, as I say, it really captures the intrepidness of the woman that we uh, write about in this book. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, this book is, um, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to buy it and to go through it, uh, but it's a book, it's an anthology of travel accounts of 45 Muslim women. And um, it's been, uh, all the accounts are, I think, in 14 languages, and you've had to translate <laughs> them. And they are uh, written in, you know, uh, various um, uh, yarns. For example, we have magazine articles, there are speeches, diary entries, poems, and even book excerpts. Um, my question uh, to Shavan would be, uh, in order to initiate the discussion, how do you see uh, these Muslim women travelers negotiating their personal, social, and cultural spaces? Um, so uh, maybe I'll just pick up on one thing that you said mm -hmm. there first, um, which is just to highlight the diversity of these women, and then I'll come to your question, mm -hmm. if I may. Um, we tried to capture as wide a selection of women in this book as we could, and I should say, too, that the women... Uh, we have a large section who come from Muslim South Asia, but also come from other parts of, of Muslim, the Muslim world as well. So um, uh, when you note that the, the excerpts are in ten, 10 different languages, they are, um, that reflects that we have uh, women writing in Arabic and Turkish and Persian and uh, English and German and <laughs> all sorts of other uh, languages as well. Um, and, and there's a quote that we have on the second page of the book, which um, really kind of, we try and sum up the, the diversity of the figures in this book. And maybe you'll just indulge me to read that one sentence. Um, we, if I can see without my glasses on, <laughs> we describe them um, as queens, reformers, pilgrims, Sufis, wives, converts, captives, flanners, literators, and provocateurs. Um, and um, uh, you asked about how they kind of navigate different spaces. And that's really a theme, I think, that's really at the center of this book. It's thinking about um, how uh, these women imagine their own spaces, their, their local spaces, their regional spaces, their national spaces, their um, the, the subcontinental space, <laughs> um, and then also what happens when they come in contact with other areas. And what's quite fascinating, I think, about lots of these women is they traveled with different ideas and purposes. So some of them kind of went away imagining, they travel to other parts of the Muslim world, for instance, they travel on Hajj, and they imagine that through that experience, through meeting with other Muslim women that they will kind of gain some understanding of, of being a part of the Ummah. Um, and yet what they often find when they enter those other spaces is that they have a certain discomfort, I suppose, mm. with it. Yeah. Um, and actually, rather than kind of uh, developing this kind of vaunted open-mindedness or sense of connection, they actually, uh, and some of them do find that, but more often they find a sense of kind of strength in some of their own identities. And so very often uh, we see that these women become very kind of aware of, uh, you know, particularly in the colonial context, they become aware of their, sen their sense of self as an Indian Muslim, for instance. 
Um, so they're navigating these different kind of spaces and they're thinking about these issues of identity and working out w w what it means not just to be Muslim, not just to be a woman, but to kind of interact with lots of their other um, senses of, of identity as well, class identities um, and, and others as well. Mm. well um, Muniza Shamsi, uh, could you tell us if there are any similarities in the way that uh, perhaps uh, Pakistani women writers in English negotiate their social, cultural, and personal spaces uh, with perhaps what Shravan has said? Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. No, I, I think it's very different. What? Um, what actually struck me about the book is not, I didn't really sort of think in terms of the younger generation because they're all traveling, they all have access to certain degrees of education, they have access to means of travel. What struck me about her book was its, its enormous span. I mean, my uh, knowledge of um, women traveling of an early era, well, they were restricted to with some of the people that Siobhan has written about, at the Afezi, uh, Sikandar Jahan of Bhopal, you know, the ladies of Bhopal. Um, of course, there was my own grandmother, which um, and um, who was a feminist and um, qu quite something. Actually, I'd like to also say that it, everyone has forgotten because she didn't migrate, but she actually proposed the women's wing of the Muslim League at the Patna Resolution in 1938, and it was passed. And it's, you'll find it in Sharif of the Impirzada, but no one else knows of it. Mm -hmm. But that was after her tra travels to, to Europe, where she discarded Parda and she got engaged with, I mean, she was already engaged as feminist issues, even in Parda, I didn't realize, and this was the thing that I realized about this book, that whether you were Parda, whether you were out of it, if you had an inquiring mind, you sort of kind of educated yourself, you looked, you questioned. And what I, uh, was amazed at, for example, in, in terms of history. I was fascinated. Some of these women describe Palestine before the creation of Israel. Mm -hmm. Some of them describe, a lot of the women, like Halida Adib is one I know, the Turkish lady who comes here. She comes to a, a women's conference. We had a strong women's conference, a women's movement, which everyone has forgotten, well, not everyone, but it's not mentioned. They, ha they, they dis address parda clubs, where the women are so conscious of women's issues. There are debates about parda, should there, should there not be parda? We're talking about the turn of the century. And um, then you have people going to, uh, w one of the Egyptian lady comes here and she makes them pass a resolution for the retention of Palestine. You know, of, mm. So they discuss Palestine. One of them, Princess Shams Pahlavi, uh, travels, I think, all the way down to South Africa. And the, the person, and then you have, I mean, I can, uh, I'm talking too much. Mm -hmm. And then you have women describing, you know, so one lady on her first airplane flight, and she said, it's so strange going on a journey and you can't see the landscapes which you pass. And one lady goes on her first subway in, um, in, in um, New York. So it, it, it is far beyond the subcontinent. I mean, to me, it is the most, and it is a, a genre of writing and it is a work that has, n a body of work that has never been given the kind of cognizance it's due. And the women's movement is not just the suffragettes, which is what we hear about, we know they suffered. But at that same time, there was this vast women's movement across, across Turkey, across India, across the world. And we have Indonesian women also uh, participating I in this awareness and in this travel. So it's, it's a terrific book. Actually, um, I was trying okay. to, uh, you know, pull a thread uh, from uh, the yarn of travel writing and Muslim women um, to the creative writing uh, by Pakistani women uh, or Muslim women. So do you see any similarity in themes or the types of negotiations that they are making? Well, um, South, South Asian poetry or creative writing, short story. Well, right? I think of travel writing and biography as creative writing, which you're thinking in terms of short stories. Um, I hadn't actually thought in terms of those uh, th that particular genre, but obviously it's there because the younger women writers, they are negotiating um, feminist issues. They mm -hmm. are negotiating the kind of patriarchal, um, I mean, you, you can't get away from that from any women's writing. If you, um, by the way, it's quite interesting. If you sit on a jury with um, 
three men writer, the odds are that the men will like books that you will say, no, no. <laughs> or that's, you know, what nonsense is the, the, the represent, I, I, I've seen this, and the, what nonsense, look at the de uh, portrayal of women, and the men won't get it. So women writers do express their experience of women, so their writing is obviously a continuation of this older generation. What the point is that we don't actually know of the links, and that is the important, that you mm. have to know your history. I mean, you have to know what your yes. past is in order to, see your present and your future. But yes, creative writing is very engaged hmm. and very much a part of what um, these yes. books are. Um, if I may just add something to that too, I mean one of the things that um, I think really defines uh, a lot of the women who write in this book are their interest in other women. Yes. Um, and I think probably that carries on into some mm. of the creative writing that, um, yes, that you're speaking about as well. You know, wherever they go, um, they're interested to understand how women are negotiating the constraints that they face in their own societies. And they comment on that. So, I mean, one thing about writing about travel writing is obviously you're constrained by literacy. So most of the uh, women in this book, you know, not all of them, but quite a lot of them, um, are enabled by privilege, that goes without saying. Um, but the, the people that they talk about, the people they describe, and the, and the people they travel with, who are their companions on this journey, very often come from other uh, social groupings and, and educational groupings as well. Um, and so through their eyes, we're able to, uh, to kind of capture that. And I think that's really seen in one of the authors we look at is called Begum Sarbulanjung, who may be familiar to some of you. Um, and. Uh, uh, she talks about uh, seeing the world through the eyes of a woman. So the idea that there's a distinct female perspective and part of that is about um, capturing the experiences of, of the women they meet. Uh, there's um, this one thing yes. I, I just like, yes. not English writing so much, but among an earlier generation, I mean the kind of work that Ismat Chukhtai and e even Gosh, when I first, because I was always taught, you know, that this is Angrezi and it's bad and it's this, you know, you've always thought you were, you were taught English, but you were also had to behave properly like a good desi girl. I mean, we taught all this good desi girl and then suddenly Fehmida Riaz appears on TV. I was blown away by Fehmida Riaz. I mean, what she was saying, gosh, um, it's much chukta. You didn't mm. have Anglophone writing of that caliber, mm. of, of that kind <coughs> of boldness, uh, Rashid mm. Jahan until later on, the younger generation is tackling those issues, so that is the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they're not going to be uh, held back. So that has changed. Mm -hmm. um, before I come back to what you said, and we can uh, delve deeper in through the book and its individual narratives, uh, Vajeha, can you, uh, you know, you edit travel writing. So um, uh, can you tell us what has changed or any, uh, peculiarities or the negotiations? Uh, do you have women uh, writing about their travels today? You know, actually, as I was uh, discussing this with you earlier, mm -hmm. I was, uh, when I was reading this book, um, it's funny how I actually realized that there, there are not a lot of women writers mm -hmm. who are actually writing about travel uh, nowadays. Like, uh, I do have a lot of wonderful writers who are still writing, uh, wonderful women writers, but not as much. Um, uh, and as far as, uh, yeah, and, and the, as far as differences are concerned, um, there are differences because, you know, these women uh, were writing, you know, all, the, all those years ago. These women were writing about, they were weaving, uh, they were sort of weaving personal narratives into uh, the social and the cultural uh, issues of uh, those times. And nowadays, um, I mostly, what I mostly get is, you know, I went there and I saw this and it's so, it's beautiful, expressive writing. But those uh, women were writing more about, you know, they were mm. actually writing, you know, diary entries. And they were writing like these, uh, like the Fezzi sisters. They were writing about, they were writing uh, to their sister um, and they were, and, uh, and those letters, they were writing letters to their sisters and those letters were then, they would later they were uh, turned into a book. They were, no, columns. columns. So yeah, exactly. So um, I don't see that kind of writing anymore, or maybe you know I've just been editing for the last three years. Mm -hmm. So there are, uh, I think you know there should be more women writers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who are who are actually writing about travel, uh, you know, as in 
writing about travel, not you know just if uh, we went there and we saw this and you know it's so beautiful. So <laughs> it's well, like, um, you know, point yes. <laughs> Sorry, I've got something to say on everything. <laughs> um, um, I just think that's quite interesting. I, I just wanted to flag that you know we very consciously uh, uh, focus this book on travel writing as opposed to travel logs, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's because so many of these terms, the term traveler, the term travel log, the term um, that they really have been kind of defined in male terms, I suppose, and so we really wanted to kind of complicate that and really move away from those kind of um, masculine yeah. qualities that are attached to those terms. Um, and actually, you know, there's, in the time that we're covering in this book, you know, the late 19th and early 20th century that we do before as well, um, there's lots of men who are writing exactly in the genre that you're saying, you know, That's these kind of um, very dull, <laughs> actually, um, travel accounts. And they become very formulaic, actually. The accounts of, you know, there's a million accounts written by men who go to study in Europe um, in the late 19th and early 20th exactly. century. Um, and they're just like that. I saw this, and there's almost like a path, as if they're like walking through London on a, on a, a particular went, path. Yeah, you know, I went to Paris, I saw uh, the Eiffel Tower. Exactly. And, so um, and I think what we get by kind of thinking about how we expand this genre is it enables us to bring in these other kinds of writings which don't necessarily fit those kind of standard ideas of travel writing, and it enables, you know, what these things these, these writings do, I think, and you've really yeah. identified that, is they, um, they're as much about the self as other. So exactly. it's a lot about kind of using that mirror of the other to kind of think about one's own self and identities. Yeah, and I just wanted to add something. You know, e the, the things that I'm getting, even now, the, the, the articles that are written by women that I get, they are just, you know, um, I, don't, I don't get a lot of articles, but the ones that I get, they are so, the, the way they write, it's just so expressive and the words yeah. are so, and it's just so generous and it's the way, the words that they use, it's just, you know, it, it reads like a story, uh, most, mm -hmm. most of these articles. Mm -hmm. And you, the, the way of, the way they express things is just completely different from, I mean, of course, it's just my opinion and I, it's just, it's not, it's mm -hmm. not a universal thing, uh, opinion, but that's what I have, that's what I have felt in all these years of uh, tackling these, uh, uh, one of the reviews I've read about your book, um, it was interesting because it stated that the females writing the narratives were seeking for a Muslim sisterhood um, outside of their bubble. Hmm. So how far do you think this is true? Um, I think that's true of some of the authors, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I mentioned before the author uh, Begum Sarbulanjung, and she was very consciously searching for this kind of sense of Muslim sisterhood. You know, she travels um, from India, um, from Hyderabad particularly, and she goes and travels around various parts of, of the Middle East, um, ultimately going um, on Hajj. And uh, when she's there, she kind of has this sense that she's going to fulfill a kind of pan-Islamic ideal. And that's, that's kind of the vision she travels with. Um, once she gets there, uh, she finds that really hard to sustain, actually. Um, and um, there's a wonderful, wonderful passage. It's one of my favorites in the book, actually, where she talks about going to the bathhouse in Damascus. Yes. Um, and I don't know if you remember this yes, one, too. Yes. Um, I don't have it at the tip of my fingers. I'd read it, but let me summarize it very quickly. Is she talks about going in, and she, before she has left India, she's tried to gain some facility in Arabic. And throughout her, her, her uh, narrative, which is in Urdu, she, um, she intersperses it with this kind of functional but broken Arabic, I would say. Um, and, and, and we've tried to keep that quality in the translation. Um, and uh, she goes into this bathhouse and she thinks, oh my God, all these women have no clothes on. Um, mm. I'm just going to stand here in the corner until they all leave and then I can have my bath. Um, and then uh, these women come up to her and they start taking off her clothes. And she's going, hey, hey, what are you doing? Don't take my clothes off. Um, and she gets uh, very heated about it. Um, and they say, come on, come on. And, and they kind of pull her in. And uh, she's trying to hold on to this tiny towel. She says, this towel's not enough to cover 
my modesty. And she's trying to hold this towel over her. And then they take her into the, into the Turkish baths. And, and she says, they're tyrants. The floor is so hot, it's burning my feet. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the whole time, she's just intensely uncomfortable. And these women are just very curious in her. They're saying, where do you come from? And why are you here? And, um, and they're really excited to get to know her. And at the same time, they're scrubbing her and taking her clothes off. And, um, and, and she's just so intensely uncomfortable. And she says, she says to them, in India, we have baths in our homes, not in the middle of the city. Um, and eventually she makes some excuse and she's like, my husband's outside, I'm leaving. And she basically kind of runs off, um, feeling very uncomfortable about that idea of Muslim sisterhood, which, <laughs> which she uh, yes. had come with. Um, uh, there are many descriptions of sacred journeys, pilgrimage, and uh, these sacred spaces. But there are also secular spaces. Um, how often do these uh, women, uh, you know, write in their narratives about these sacred spaces and their pilgrimage? What is uh, the, their perspective in writing on these spaces? Are they different from the normal narratives that we come across? Mm -hmm. uh, how are they presented differently in their travel writing? Yeah. Um, so um, maybe I can just say, take a moment there to say that this book is um, organized not exclusively by mm. time or place, um, but by motivation. So why women chose to travel. And we chose that thematic organization very purposefully um, because one, it sort of fore foregrounded women's own agency, why they were, why they were traveling. Um, and also because it enabled comparison. So we didn't want the women of South Asia to sit apart from women from other parts of the world. And we wanted a chance to kind of think comparatively and to get people to read the book comparatively and think about, okay, are women in Egypt writing the same as women in Turkey or Central Asia at, at the same time? And then within the sections, they're, they're organized chronologically. So um, as you rightly note, um, a lot of these women uh, traveled for uh, religious reasons mm -hmm. and that really um, so the whole the first section of the book is travel as pilgrimage um, we then move on to um, travel for political purposes and travel as education and ultimately um, travel for duty and leisure um, and uh, I might have the title slightly wrong there but um, that's the rough idea um, and uh, yeah, these women are very keen to narrate their Hajj and, and to show that it is um, very often those kind of uh, uh, religious uh, impulse, impulses that enable them to travel because mm. um, that can give justification to what they're doing. And so very often that will be the sort of first stepping stone for many of them. They will go on Hajj and then, then maybe further jo journeys follow. Mm. Um, and in narrating those journeys, they're very different in terms of how they describe those sacred spaces, I think. Um, some women um, go on Hajj and are so overwhelmed by the spiritual experience and describe it with such beauty um, and such um, uh, just uh, emotion, I suppose. You really feel that emotion captured in their accounts. Um, Others actually are a little more like the ones we were talking about before. They're, they're much more kind of quotidian and, um, and even mundane in some ways. They become much more caught up in the kind of, oh, it was really hard to get from Makkah to Medina. Um, and we had to, um, we had to get on this camel and then the, you know, these Bedouins came along. And, you know, so there's, uh, some of them are much more about the kind of complexities of the journey. And you think, where, where is the, where is the emotion? Where is the religious experience? Um, and, and yeah, there, I think what that all highlights is, is really, you know, um, we brought these narratives together, um, but they're incredibly diverse. And really this, is, this book is a kind of mediation in a way on the diversity of Islam. Um, um, Bunisa, would you like to talk about the way in which the women have talked about Parda in the book? Or any other aspect which you feel uh, is unique in, in terms of their perspectives? on uh, some of the things they've encountered in their travel writing well, or during their travels. Well, specific for the, again, it's what Siobhan says, the diversity of the book. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have someone who goes to Damascus from India and, and thinks, oh, well, they're so European, you know, they're, they're, you know 
what um, one one person goes to um, England, I think, goes to Europe, and feels rather odd being able to, or, or not uncomfortable, not being chaperoned, not, not thinking it's nice. And yet, in other places, you find them admiring Parda. Um, so, well, th there were so many other aspects. Uh, I, I've already mentioned the, the travel aspect, the um, difference of um, cultural response. Um, I think Sikandar Zaman, uh, Sikandar Begum, I think she goes, when she goes on Hajj, she comments on Arab culture, and you know, there are a lot of things that she doesn't quite approve of. You get a um, Turkish person going and saying, well, you know, the Greeks are very nice, but they really don't have the same sense of hospitality. You give them, they're not gonna give it to you. There's one, I mean, I, I, love, the, I love the differences and the, 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 there, was, there was an immensely visual aspect to it. The, the, the descriptions of the place is so beautiful, they're lovely trees, they're parks, and then at some point, and there's one lady who's um, driven out of Turkey, who thinks Turkey is terrible, they, they've had political problems, and that's also fascinating mm -hmm. to me. pre ataturk tur Turkey, uh, post ataturk in the middle, people getting persecuted. Anyway, she, she, then she goes to Europe, where she's, people are not particularly kind, and you know, and she comes back and she says, "Well, Turkey is a minus, and so is Europe." You know, <laughs> so um, you know, you're, you're kind of, and this again, this business of being in the middle, of being, I, that was something that also fascinated me, being a little different to the norm, either here or there. And there was that other wonderful description, I think, again, of a Turkish or an Arab lady. She goes to America, and they say, oh, welcome back to America. And she said, but I'm not American. <laughs> they all look at her and say, what? You know, so this kind of rejection of otherness and this assertion of not otherness, um, I found that very interesting in, in this book. And I think it really, actually, yes, uh, the question I wanted to ask was, how did you choose these texts? Because mm -hmm. there are some in Persian, some in, mm -hmm. some in Urdu, some in Turkish, and you had two translators working with you, um, Daniel and uh, Sunil. Mm -hmm. But how, do, how, did the, how did the three of you come across these texts? <laughs> Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe the first point to make is um, we have three editors, um, myself and Daniel and Sunil, um, uh, but actually we worked with an enormous team and that's the only way that you could do a book like this um, in order to capture the kind of diversity of experience and diversity of writing. So uh, we actually worked with a number of um, academic specialists who worked on literary traditions um, in, in all different parts of the Muslim world. And uh, in some cases, for instance, in Central Asia, um, and also Egypt for that matter, we kind of had this idea that there must be uh, sources and we must be able to find them in certain places. You know, um, all three of the editors are actually specialists uh, on South Asia. Um, but we kept thinking, well, we know where we'd find these places in South Asia, maybe we can find them there. And, and they simply didn't exist in the places we thought, nor did they seem to exist in anywhere else. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's gaps, and that's because there actually seems to be gaps in terms of where travel writing is, is being produced. So uh, we're very grateful, not just, uh, you know, not just to my two fellow editors, but to this wide team that worked with us on this project as well. Um, I think when we started, we wondered, would we have enough for a book? <laughs> um, um, and so we started with this kind of inclusiveness, this idea that, okay, excellent, let's just keep searching and finding things and we'll, we'll kind of bring things in. And um, uh, some of you may know that the book I did before this was on the history of autobiography mm. or autobiographical writing in South Asia, in Muslim South Asia. And uh, in the course of that, I did, uh, a lot of my research has focused on uh, family collections, uh, private collections, and what is um, kept within families. So I had this kind of a set of travel narratives that people had shared with me that had been kept or shared within their khandan. And, and then at the same time, Daniel was working on uh, his own PhD dissertation, which was um, on travel writing. And he'd looked at a lot of published texts. Um, so we thought, okay, well, we'll mine this set of resources that we've kind of looked at before, and then we'll, we'll keep searching. 
Um, and then, wow, it, more and more and more <laughs> started coming out of the, the woodwork. So you'll notice that this is a hefty tome. Um, it's over 500 pages. It's big format as well. Um, and that's because in the end, we settled on 45 chapters, um, but we could have had more. And actually, even as it went to press, um, people kept kind of coming to us and going, oh, you know, my grandmother wrote this, or, um, which is amazing. And for that reason, we really hope this will just be an impetus to further work and further interest in this area. Um, so in the end, uh, one, we focused on kind of narratives, I suppose, that were about connecting places, far, mostly fairly far off places. Um, I don't think we can say international because there was all sorts of different kind of understandings of connections in this period. So, you know, we have one author, Noor Begum, who travels from Punjab, um, and she goes on Hajj. Yeah. And when she gets to Bombay, as it was at the time, um, she feels like she's gone to a foreign land entirely. She's never seen the sea. She's def certainly never been on a boat. Yeah. And gosh, does she get seasick. Um, and, uh, um, and she really sees Bombay as like a foreign, foreign land, as it were. Um, similarly, you know, many of the women who travel from princely states into British-ruled India, they see that as a kind of crossing of a border. And yet at the same time, many women who traveled from one part of the British Empire to another, you know, they had a passport that enabled that transfer. So to them, that's not moving outside of their kind of geographical area. So as I say, I don't think we can call it international travel, but we tried to focus primarily on kind of these connections between different um, regional areas. And we've really, in choosing the extracts, we've kept our focus on what was the focus of these women as well, which was primarily their relations and exchanges with other women. Um, and that's what we, we kind of foregrounded, I suppose. Uh, Vidya, any particular passages or themes that leapt out at you from the book while you were reading? Yeah, exactly. I was actually, uh, just as uh, Munisa Appa said, uh, it was the thing that um, really struck me with this book, that the, uh, the many different things that these women were talking about. And uh, uh, most of these women were talking about the same place, and, uh, but the narratives were completely different. Uh, which I, I found, which was extremely interesting to me. And another thing that I wanted to ask you about was, um, uh, so most of these women uh, that we, uh, that, uh, we have uh, mentioned in this book, is, uh, uh, these women are basically, they come uh, from uh, privileged backgrounds, from, uh, you know, they have wealth, they have the means to travel. Um, how the means to travel and also the means to write. I the think means that's to write, important. exactly. Yeah. So how do we keep those women in uh, mind who traveled with them, mm. but they did not have the means to write? They did not. They weren't literate enough, or uh, I mean, they uh, or they did not know how to put their thoughts, and you know, they could not really articulate their thoughts. So how do we keep those women in mind, and how do we, how do we, who didn't have these means? Um, so we, we were very conscious of that, actually. You know, um, you know, this is a book about travel writing, and it gives us a view into a certain sect yeah. of travel travelers, female travelers, Muslim female travelers. I keep expanding that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, but at the same time, we really wanted to uh, show awareness of that broader trend. And of course, uh, very clear that, you know, as people um, are experiencing mobility throughout history, um, that women are there too, right? They're there for the journey. Um, so we do have a section in the introduction which is called Women in Cultures of Travel, where we draw out some of those broader patterns uh, of travel by other women. Um, and we were also trying to be very attentive to the, the women that are traveling with the women who are riding, if you see what I mean. Um, so always kind of seeking out, okay, who's with them on this journey? Um, did they, you know, many of them claim to travel alone, um, but that claim is not exactly true in many cases because often they're traveling with mm. domestic uh, support, domestic help. Um, one, the woman I just mentioned, Norbegum, for instance, she says, uh, I, I've, I've been left bereft. I'm, my, my father has died and I'm left to make this journey on my own. And she only mentions like at the very end of her poetic narrative that actually her husband was with her. Um, <laughs> Um, as if he didn't matter at all. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Um, so uh, there's kind of some interesting omissions and some interesting kinds of, um, yeah, yeah, ways of dealing with this. So we always sort of tried to, to kind of find ways that we could draw out those other experiences, particularly, so each chapter has extracts from the, the original narratives in translation. Um, and then it also has these, uh, what I think are really rich kind of introductions, which are biographical on one hand, but also really try to put the narratives in a, in a historical and cult, uh, literary context. Um, and it's within those contexts that maybe we're able to kind of pull out some of those, those broader experiences. I also shouldn't overlook that some of the women who are included in, in this are really uh, very not privileged. <laughs> um, so uh, I think it keeps popping up on the screen behind me. Um, but uh, we have one traveler from uh, Central Asia. Uh, she writes a book called The History of Immigrants. Um, and it's because she gets uh, caught up in the wars of Central Asia um, and she be she's captured in those wars and she's taken to uh, another Khanate and uh, there she's kind of, first of all, treated as sort of a d domestic slave and then eventually sort of married off. Um, and she really plays very strongly through that process, she gains literacy, which enables her to write. But she really makes very clear that uh, she comes from, that she's sort of the voice of the common people, as it were. Um, and, and some very, actually very disturbing passages where she talks about how being caught up in these conflicts and how her father is, uh, is well, literally loses his head and is left to rot in the street. And she and her grandmother are the only ones in the family to survive. And they, she makes her money by spinning um, uh, for the next little while to, to support them. So there are um, alternative stories as well. Um, and I guess, too, within some of the families that we've looked at, um, we're able to capture some of those other trends, too, I think. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk a little about the readership. Um, uh, the public for whom they were writing or were they writing for themselves because you know um, there, there are narratives of pilgrimage to Mecca then uh, you have letters and diary entries such as those written by uh, Begum Sargulang Jung, Umat Ali, uh, Umat Ghani, Nurul Nasa and uh, Muhammadi Begum they were intended only for family members to read but at the same time uh, there were also uh, important segments where you had, you know, Dilshad, a, a Tajik poet, historian and teacher who was abducted and forced to flee to Uzbekistan when her homeland was invaded. Then you also had, um, uh, you have an extract from the Egyptian writer Amina Said, uh, Travelogue in India, and she discusses her thoughts on Indian cities and um, she sets about correcting inaccurate perceptions of the Palestinian dilemma. Then you have Mohammadi Begum writing about colonialism. So what was the readership at the time? And did that affect um, the writing? And more so, uh, Vajiha, nowadays, is there a change in the readership? And is that why we don't have too many females writing um uh, so i think you've really captured in just in your question actually um the variety of uh the sources that we drew on and and how that the nature of the sources changes the audience mm -hmm. um so as you say some of them uh, maybe only imagined originally at least uh, um, a readership of one or two maybe mm -hmm. family mem members others were written in kind of family journals that might have been circulated within a khandan mm -hmm. um, a lot of others wrote for women's journals so mm -hmm. they saw themselves as writing for for other women in a kind of female space um, and so that very much influenced just to kind of answer your question mm -hmm. there influenced the kind of topics they took up so they tried to take up things that they thought were of interest uh, to other women um, um, and, and then others, you know, uh, we have, I think I mentioned already that our um, second section is called Travel as Emancipation and Politics. 
Um, and those women were using the, the form of the travelogue really to, um, to spread a political message. Um, and that might be a feminist message, but equally it might be a nationalist cause or indeed a communist cause. Uh, so we have um, a number of Indonesian women who traveled to the Soviet Union in the early 1950s um, seeking uh, um, understanding of, of Soviet communism. Um, and they really are using this form to kind of broadcast a, me a message far and wide. So um, I can't generalize on who the audience was, but I would definitely say that it influences the writings themselves and the kind of topics that the individual writers uh, address. Um, I have a question for all three of you. Um, when I was doing my research, Yes, uh, <laughs> I'm keeping her in, on track. <laughs> in a lot of Muslim, uh, in a lot of Muslim travel narratives, we have the male traveler as a rehla figure, a talib ilm, a seeker of knowledge. What is the adab -e rehla, Islamic yarn of travel writing? And how far do these narratives deviate from it? What about the Muslim female travelers? Are they narratives of eyewitness accounts? Or are they also knowledge seekers, like the Muslim tra male travelers? Yes, and <laughs> I feel like I'm doing all the talking, but. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, very, very much this uh, concept of kind of um, travel as education, I suppose, um, comes yes. up very strongly. And what's quite interesting actually is um, there's this phrase um, which, the, which we see in Ibn Battuta, for instance, where mm -hmm. he talks about travel as a means to success or victory um, and how you know, your, your world will be expanded, your knowledge will be expanded, yes. um, and that that will come through travel. And you know, this sort of quoting of, of various um, uh, extracts from the Hadith and that and sort of I thing. And I think travel as a means, uh, uh, not uh, as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. An end in itself, absolutely, mm. yeah. Um, and what's quite interesting is that while we see that in those kind of early uh, travelogues by men, um, that that concept gets reworked in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of these women authors actually using that very same phrase. Um, uh, one example is uh, Sultan Jahan Begum of mm. Bhopal. She uses this very phrase that is, and she quotes Ibn Battuta and says, you know, I am also doing a uh, rela, but she's understanding it uh, you know, re as I say, a kind of reinterpretation of that, I think, in the colonial context. Um, so she's, you know, seeing it as um, uh, a, a means, as you say, kind of um, travel as a means in, its, in itself, but also as, as a way to gain education. So I should stress that in the section on travel as education, uh, part of that is kind of a formal education. You know, sometimes it's people going to travel to study at universities ab abroad or or um, or otherwise. Um, but for some, it's it's a much more informal process, and it's it's kind of really engaging actually with that concept. Mm -hmm. I would say. So, Funisa, do you think that they are seekers of knowledge, or are they eyewitness accounts, or somewhere in between? Well. It it keeps coming back to me, and I might be wrong, uh, that, you know, for a man to travel, if you want to go somewhere, well, okay, it's a right. Mm -hmm. For a woman, it's not a right. So if you, whether you seek knowledge or whether you just go, I think it's a privilege. And mm -hmm. so your whole perception would surely be yeah. different to someone who thinks mm -hmm. there's a right and I'm going to seek knowledge and da-da-da-da, mm -hmm. to someone who thinks, well, you know, uh, let me see what I can get out of it, or what, what, what am I going to learn <laughs> from it? Um, this is what I see. I might, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking the top of my head. I might that, not be right. That's wonderful. Do you have? I think they have actually answered this question. <laughs> yeah, but um, I think you know the best kind of uh, 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 accounts that I have uh, received are from people who actually go travel for the sake of travel. Yeah, of course, you know, there are people who go uh, for education and then they, mm. uh, they, uh, you know, they express their, uh, their uh, the whatever they see and whatever they're, ex they ex they're experiencing. But uh, most, of the, uh, most of the more interesting ones that I get 
are from the ones who are actually traveling for the sake of travel mm. and of course you know it's a privilege mm. of course you know that's like um goes i've beyond. been told we have five minutes before uh, the q a session so i'd like shovan to read from her book any favorite particular favorite one okay. out of all the book and any other passages you would like to share with us Okay, um, I have so many favorites in this book, and I told you a little bit about the one in the bathhouse already, which is definitely one of my favorites. Um, but I, I think I'll um, take one from a woman called uh, Rahil Beg Begum Shavani, who went on a pilgrimage in the early 1920s. And why I love her writing so much is one, she's incredibly acerbic, so <laughs> incredibly critical of just about everything. Um, but also really witty. Um, and so there's a real kind of humorous quality to her writing. Um, now, um, let's, let me see if I can, I've forgotten my glasses over there, so we'll, <laughs> we'll see if I can get through this. But um, uh, let's see, hold on one second. Oh, so um, I also like this one because um, having finished this book, I'm now working on a book on food history, um, and I'll be speaking about that in the Forgotten Foods panel tomorrow. Um, but this is also about food, um, so it kind of fits with both of my, both of my interests. Um, so, so this is a, from a section which we've called On Luggage. Um, and she says, um, let's see, where, where can I start? One of the women, so she's talking about speaking to other women within the um, kind of uh, first class passage on a HUD ship. One of them asked me how much luggage I was traveling with. I replied that we had four boxes, two trunks, and a roll of bedding. What about your cooking supplies, she said. They're all stored in the luggage, I said. One asked how many food stores I had brought. None whatsoever, I answered. Of course, on the advice of others, I had brought with me a can of key, but I've since heard that we'll have to pay a tax on it. So I'm thinking I'll just distribute it to the other passengers and avoid the headache of haggling over the tax. When the women heard this, they began whispering agitatedly amongst themselves. One spoke up to ask if I was really so concerned about a single canister. We alone have four canisters with us, plus two sacks of wheat flour, a sack of rice, a sack of dal, spices and seed seasonings, and so on. I asked her, what sort of disaster was she expecting that she would bring so many supplies with her? She replied, sister, we wouldn't bear, be able to bear eating Mecca Sharif's stinking ghee for a single day. Why? Aren't the residents of Mecca human too? Human or not, everyone has their own habits and tastes. We'd rather eat boiled f food than their key. Even if we have to go without food for four days, we won't put that key in our mouths. To which I replied, well, then you yourself should take my canister of ghee. I will eat that sticky, rotten key instead. She went on, the wheat there is so bad, it clogs up your intestines. And she then proceeded to trash every single grain of wheat in Mecca Sharif. <laughs> There were about 20 women there, each of whom took turn to sing the highest praises of the items that they'd brought with them and to try to scare me by impressing upon me my impending suffering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can take some question and questions from the audience. Yes. Can we have the mic here, please? Um, I just raised my hand because my arm was longer, but it's my niece who wants to ask you a question, Siobhan. <laughs> um, she's an avid reader and a future author as well, so as a oh, Muslim wonderful. author, I think oh, it would be really nice to hear from her as well. There you go. Um, okay. So I have a nice question for the, um, uh, related to the book. Uh, what is the goal you are trying to reach by exposing these um, diverse narratives of Muslim women to the world? Thank you, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> Um, so I guess there's, there's different objects in writing a book like this. Um, on one hand, uh, you probably heard at the beginning that my official title is Professor of Global History. Um, and within global history as a kind of sub-discipline, uh, these are not the kind of stories that are seen as part of that history, you know? When we talk about travelers or we talk about global history, too often 
the protagonists are white men, essentially. Um, so in some ways, we hope to uh, reach uh, those global historians um, and um, people interested in kind of global travel and global change to try and show them that there's a different perspective and a gendered perspective um, that, that, that you can get through these. At the same time, these are narratives very much forgotten in the literary traditions out of which they came. Um, and I think that's kind of indicated in the, the long search that we often had to go through to find them. So I mentioned Norbegum's uh, narrative before. Um, that was published um, in Punjab in the early part of the 20th century, and it went into multiple printings. Um, but I suspect none of you have heard of Norbegum today, even though uh, she wrote in uh, in in poetry, actually. Her narrative is entirely in poetry, um, and it's a beautiful piece of Odu literature, um, and yet uh, she's so often forgotten. Um, so I think uh, we're also trying to bring these women back to the, uh, to the literary traditions out of which they come. Uh, I think we have another question here. The only thing I like to want to say is that I agree with the fact that there should uh, be more women writers because uh, in the Far East and Asian countries, men dominate everything. And uh, there should be more women writers and we should encourage them to write and flourish as flourish. Thank you. I'm hoping by bringing to light some of these historical examples that it will uh, provide models and inspiration maybe for a new generation of writers too like the young girl. <laughs> we have some questions there and then here. Uh, here, G, yes. Sorry, who, I didn't quite catch the name, sorry. Uh, Rukaya oh, Sukha. Yes. yes. Sorry, I uh, didn't so hear you. I was just wondering which excerpt you had because we, I have just read the Sultana's Dream. Ah, yes. And so you know that that is another genre altogether. So yeah. I was just curious. Yes, Rukaya uh, Sukha mm, yeah. I was wondering whether this was a travel. A yeah, Clearly yeah. a travel excerpt. Yeah, so she wrote a fascinating travel account, very uh, not well known, as your, as your question probably suggests. We, we know her for Sultana's Dream, and we know her maybe for some of her work that has been translated from Urdu, or you maybe read it or, um, in Bengali, sorry. Um, but she also, in um, a local magazine in Bengali, she wrote an account of a journey that she took with her husband um, in the very early part of the 20th century when they traveled into the Himalaya, so up to to Darjeeling, um, and it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying in that for her that was quite a foreign space, um, and she talks about kind of the traveling on the little train that you take up, you know, the single uh, single track train up to Darjeeling and stopping along the way, um, and her experience of, of traveling with British mem subs on the same train and, and how they would stop um, uh, at the different stations and interact. So um, yeah, it is, and it's, I don't know if anyone has really drawn attention to it before, and that really kind of exemplifies many of the pieces in this book um, that, you know, this is, is a really uh, rich source of unusual narratives, I would say. I think we have uh, time just for one more question. So, Ji. Good evening, everyone. Good it evening. is a pleasure having you all here. And uh, although one can draw a lot of conclusions, but to make it more clear, I have a question that if you could draw some uh, parallels or differences between the writings in 19th and 20th century and the modern feminist writings? I'll leave that to you too. <laughs> <laughs> I stop in 1958. <laughs> <laughs> now you can answer it. <laughs> Indeed. Well, I mean, it, 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 it was a, it, it, in a way, it's a different world, and yet in a way, it's a continuation, because on, on the one hand, you've, you've got social customs saying that you can't do this and you can't do that, and yet these women go and they explore, they break these branches. And among the 21st century, you've got a lot of young women uh, who are perhaps allowed to travel, and yet they still encounter prejudices, they encounter social customs, they encounter um, all kinds of differences. Um, 
I can't offhand think of a 21st century feminist narrative, because I think younger girls in the 21st century, at least in Pakistan by and large, but there must be many, who've got more freedom. But you know, Atiyah Begum, at, at the turn of the century, how many people know that the turn of the 19th and 20th century, Atiya Begum goes off unmarried woman in her 30s, how old, I don't know how old she was. She was and 29 at the time. And 20, so, she yeah. goes off a young unmarried, unmarried woman <laughs> to go to the Lady Mariah Training College, to go to a university in London, all by herself. And I, as, and I have known many instances of, uh, certainly in my generation, of young women who were not allowed to go to universities because nobody would marry them, or because, you know, and, and young, I, I, one of my friends actually said, because she, she overheard this young man said, oh, I won't marry that girl, she's been abroad. Mm. Good God, you know, so th there was this kind of thing. And so the 21st century, there must be young women who still confront this, so the ones who are writing, at least in English, are those who have had the opportunity at least to take advantage of education Today, at least among the professional classes, uh, people give the boys and girls the same degree of education. They even let the girl have a career. In the old days, say 20, 30 years ago, this was not the norm. So that has changed. But whether it has changed to other people who are, don't belong to these kind of professional families who are now looking for economic opportunities, we don't know, and especially particularly, incidentally, in the diaspora, which is another interesting uh, mm -hmm. thing, because in the diaspora, the parents try to hang on to the customs of another time. So they mm -hmm. try and impose mm -hmm. on them customs that um, are no longer applicable in so, modern yeah. Pakistan. Mm -hmm. exactly. Very true. Things have changed Very true. So it's a kind of interesting thing. But to read these books means that you should see what people in the past did, so to know that what you're doing in the present is not unusual or not rare, and that you're just a part of a continual process. Uh, thank you. Can I just add yes. one tiny thing yes. to that, which, sorry, I've always got something to add. Um, <laughs> just to say, I mean, reading these narratives, I think some sometimes they'll feel very, like the past is a foreign country, that these women were experiencing different things than maybe that we we do in the in the present sometimes these things will be recognizable mm. um, and or maybe they'll be recognizable to maybe stories you've heard from a mother or grandmother um, or great grandmother um, on other times the the narratives are just very human you know and mm. and you can read them and I I think there's one um, by a woman called Mohammed Begum um, who I had the pleasure of meeting her granddaughter last weekend actually um, and um, I, I'm a mother of two children and she writes about a train journey that she did with her infant child uh, from Bonn in Germany to Oxford in London on her own with this child and she narrates like the difficulties of traveling with that child um, and in quite intimate detail you know she says how do I go into the toilets and and have a wee while holding the baby. <laughs> um, and, um, um, you know, these are um, maybe the sort of things that many mothers have experienced um, <laughs> throughout their, uh, through their experiences. So, you know, there's a certain, um, a certain frankness, which is obviously clear in that anecdote, but also a certain hu level of humanity that, that draws us to uh, these women and their stories. Um, and, and I think that makes it a a, a journey that we want to go along with them. Thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you, Shervan Lambert Hurley. Thank you, Muniza Shamsi. And thank you, Vijaya Heather, for being with us. Thank you all very much. <laughs>